Integration was developed as a way to calculate the area under a curve. Then came a function that was impossible to integrate. This dilemma would lead one mathematician to invent an entirely new approach. An approach that would change the way we think about the integral forever. In 1868, Bernard Riemann invented the first ever rigorous definition of an integral. This powerful technique allowed mathematicians to approximate the area under a curve by first calculating the areas of simple rectangles and then summing them all up. The more rectangles, the better the approximation. And in the limit that the number of rectangles approached infinity, one would arrive at the Riemann integral. This method worked incredibly well for a large class of functions namely all functions that are continuous. But something strange happens when you consider a specific sequence of functions that are all Riemann integrable. We'll start with the function defined by f of x equals zero everywhere. This function is clearly integrable and the area under it is just zero. We'll now build a sequence of functions out of it. So let's call this function f0. f1 will be defined similarly, except that the points x equals one and x equals 0. f1 will equal 1. Is this still Riemann integrable? Yes. We can still approximate the area with rectangles. Everywhere on the interval outside these two points, the area is still just 0. But if we draw a rectangle at either of these points, we can make it as thin as we want. In the limit, the area of these rectangles is also 0. So f1 is Riemann integrable, and its integral is 0. Similarly, we can construct f2 by having it equal 1 at an additional point, 1 half. For the exact same reason as f1, f2 is also Riemann integrable. We can continue building similar functions, f3, f4, and so on. Each and every single one of these functions will be Riemann integrable. But as the limit approaches infinity, this sequence of functions converges to the Dirichlet function a function that equals 1 for every rational point and 0 for every irrational point. The Dirichlet function is impossible to integrate with the Riemann integral. This is because both the rationals and the irrationals are packed incredibly tightly in the real number line. The technical term is that they are dense in the reals. No matter how small of an interval you make at a specific rational, you will always also capture an infinite number of irrationals. And the same goes the other way. For any interval around an irrational, you're guaranteed to have an infinite number of rationals inside. So any attempt at drawing a rectangle will always fail. We've arrived at a strange conclusion. We have a sequence of functions that are all integrable, yet they converge to a function that has no integral at all. The resolution to this puzzle requires an entirely new framework that broadens the domain of integrable functions. Enter Henri Lebesgue. In his 1902 PhD thesis, Henri Lebesgue invented an ingenious method that could successfully integrate the wild Dirichlet function. His key idea was simple yet profound. Instead of dividing up the x-axis into smaller and smaller intervals, as we do with the Riemann integral, Lebesgue suggested dividing up the range or the vertical axis instead. In this case, there are only two possible values that the Dirichlet function can take. 1 and 0. For a function that takes on additional values, you would divide it up into more regions. In order to evaluate the Lebesgue integral, all we need to do is to take the value on the y-axis and multiply by the length of the interval that takes on those values. For the irrational points, we have f of x equals 0. So their contribution is 0 times the length of the irrationals, which just evaluates to 0. For the rational contribution, we multiply 1 by the length of the rationals. But how in the world do we calculate the length of the rationals? There are an infinite number of points scattered throughout the interval. For this, we will need the Lebesgue measure. Essentially, this is the formal theory that Lebesgue developed in order to precisely describe the abstract length or volume of almost any mathematical set. I explained it in detail in my previous video on the Vitali set, which I've linked below, so you can check it out later if you're interested. But for now, all we need is one of the defining properties of the Lebesgue measure, namely that the length of any point is zero. The notation that's commonly used for this abstract length is the letter mu. 
Since the rationals are just an infinite set of discrete points, then the length of the rationals is just the sum of the lengths of each of these points. So the rationals have a length of zero, which means that the Lebesgue integral of this function is zero. If we slightly change the function so that it was zero at all the rational points, but one at all the irrational points instead, then the integral would change as follows. The rational contribution would be zero, but the irrational contribution would now be whatever the length of the irrationals is. We can calculate this from the fact that the entire interval from zero to one has a length of one. This interval consists of all real numbers, but the real numbers are just the union of the rationals and the irrationals. And since the rationals have length zero, the irrationals must have a length of one, which means the Lebesgue integral of this modified Dirichlet function is now one. This video has been covering some pretty heavy math concepts. If you're looking for a place to learn some more interesting math, a great place to start is this video's sponsor, brilliant.org. Whether you're looking to learn more higher math like linear algebra or group theory, or just trying to brush up on your calculus knowledge, Brilliant has you covered. Something that's a constant battle for me when learning about complicated math topics is to figure out how I can get a good intuitive understanding for what's really going on. That's where Brilliant shines. Their lessons are organized into neat levels that really build up your intuition on a topic. Beginning with the basic fundamentals, you'll be able to work through many examples and countless interactive visuals that truly help you deeply understand a topic. To try all this and more for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash abide by reason, or click on the link in the description. You will also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Now, even though it was the limit of a sequence of functions, it turns out that the Dirichlet function is an example of what mathematicians call a simple function. That is a function that takes on some finite number of values. Here, we have only two values, but for an arbitrary simple function, we could have any finite number of values. We can then define the Lebesgue integral for a simple function over an interval from A to B as follows. We consider each value that the function takes and multiply it by the length of the set that gives those values. We then take the sum over all these values, and this gives us the Lebesgue integral of a simple function. This can then be generalized to any function that is non-negative, which means that it is at or above the x-axis everywhere. By taking all possible simple functions that are below it, we can approximate any non-negative function. If we form an increasing sequence of these simple functions, then they will necessarily converge to f. So the Lebesgue integral of f will just be the limit of these integrals. In fact, this is a specific example of an extremely powerful theorem central to measure theory, the monotone convergence theorem, which essentially guarantees that anytime you have a sequence of functions converging, then you can always freely interchange integrals and limits. The final step to define this integral for its full class of functions is to just extend this approach. For sections where a function is negative, we take the absolute value and again approximate using simple functions. We then just subtract this contribution from the contribution where the function is positive. This allows us to find the Lebesgue integral for almost any function you can think of. Now, since we use the Dirichlet function to motivate the need for the Lebesgue integral, you might think that it's just useful for weird functions like this. But why else should we care about it? What practical applications could this new integral possibly have? Well, there are many reasons some of which have to do with highly technical math, but others which involve its use in probability theory, Fourier analysis, and even quantum mechanics. If you want to learn more about some of the technical reasons, I've left a link to an incredible article that goes into the details below. But for this video, I'd like to instead give you an analogy. The best analogy I've encountered to get an intuitive taste of the importance of the Lebesgue integral is by comparison of the rational numbers to the real numbers. The real numbers are the completion of the rationals in the following sense. There are many sequences you encounter that consist purely of rational points, yet somehow they converge to a point that is not rational. By introducing real numbers then, we are able to work in a much larger space, one that is complete and totally beyond the scope of the rationals.
This allows us to not only find real numbers that are limits of sequences, but it also allows us to find solutions to equations we couldn't have solved otherwise. The rationals are just not equipped to handle a lot of the math we want to do. The real numbers give us a much better theory to work with. In a similar way, Lebesgue's integral provides a much better theory of integration. There are many sequences of Riemann integrable functions that converge to a function that is not Riemann integrable. The sequence we saw earlier is just one example, but there are many others. This becomes crucially important in areas like Fourier analysis or quantum mechanics, where the main objects of study are functions and how they interact with one another. In fact, a certain class of functions that are Lebesgue integrable show up everywhere in these subjects. And they form something called an L2 space, a vector space which is complete and guaranteed to have all the convergence properties you would want. This space also goes by another name, a Hilbert space, the abstract setting where wave functions live and all the calculations of quantum mechanics take place.